Hi there, and welcome to From This Corner TV. I'm Marilyn Dayton, your host and producer. And I want to welcome you for a special reason tonight. Um, you know, the, the show is not just to entertain you, but also to um, give you information that you can use in your life, kind of educational and interesting. And we've really got an interesting show tonight. Uh, especially anyone out there that has a relationship with anyone, which is like all of you. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to talk about uh, women create the life you want, but it could be men create the life you want. It could be children create the life you want. And our guest is Karen C.L. Anderson. Karen's a writer, speaker, master certified life coach, and author of The Peaceful Daughter's Guide to Separating from a Difficult Mother. And that is not what you think it is. <laughs> the word separation is not what you think it is. She's dedicated to the concept that the truth never creates suffering. And all stories can be told through the lens of truth. Karen helps women create a life they love based on their preferences, needs, and desires. Not the preferences, needs, and desires, or shoulds, of their mothers. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome to our show. Thank you. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all for living my own life. Okay. I think everyone out there is all for living your own life, right? So get pen, paper, as I usually tell you, because you're going to want to write a few things down tonight. <laughs> so, so Karen, tell me, what, what, what does this all mean? What does this, uh, this book create the life you want and, um, and, and what women should do. Let's, let's start at the very beginning Well, let's here. take the word should out. Okay. <laughs> let's take that out. It's gone. So, um, so I, I, I wrote this book, um, well, for several reasons. But as you might imagine, I have a mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. We all do. <laughs> and I struggled in that relationship. And as I was um, sort of moving through my life in the past 10 years or so, I, I was able to sort of like look back and realize that I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Like, what do I want? What do I desire? What are my needs, right? What, is, what, what are my preferences even? Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, I'd been living my life based on, you know, what my mother told me I should want, you know, and, and not just my mother, but I mean, I think a lot of women, I often joke that I felt like a balloon that was just sort of drifting in the breeze, you know, like from this thing to that thing, not really sure of what, you know, what is it that I desire and I want and what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. So, um... I ended up going to life coach school, <laughs> um, and I'm a, I'm a writer first and foremost. But I um, I started to meet some life coaches, and it was in that process that my mother's stuff really came up. And I had done therapy, and I had done all kinds of other things, but it wasn't until I started learning some of these life coaching concepts that um, that it re like it, it really changed it really made a difference because i was starting to take responsibility you know for those desires preferences you know needs and to own them okay we should all do that right yeah well if we, if you want to yeah <laughs> <laughs> well if you find out who you if you want to find out who you are and what you want to do you've got to kind of kind of do that research with yourself yeah yeah and you know, I mean, I think, I don't know about other, the, the tra other tr trainings that they have out there for life coaches, and there's a lot of them. Yeah. But um, I think that the good ones require you to do your own work. So, yes, you're learning concepts and techniques, but you're also working on your own stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, um, during the trainings that I went through, it just so happened to be at a time when things with my mother had kind of gotten 
really tense and and um, so I was I was working that out and the the result of that and the impact that it's had on my life in such a positive way I couldn't keep it to myself <laughs> and so you wrote the book now so I wrote you, the book. you said writing is is what you I know I've known you for years and mm -hmm. you were always writing yeah you were writing your blog you were writing articles for publications mm -hmm. um, and what what uh, caused you to go from writing to want to study life coaching well it's kind of interesting I um, so I wrote my first book um, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about I guess at some point um, I wrote that book and it was it did come out of blogging and okay. and that um, blog that I had first started it was in 2009 was about self-acceptance and body image mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the self-loathing that I had for my body and um, so I, I took a lot of the blog that I had written and I um, edited it and I added to it and I created a book and in 2012, a friend of mine invited me to um, a weekend, I guess it was, I don't know if she would call it a retreat, but it was a, a sort of a business building uh, retreat. Um, there were hundreds of people there um, down in Georgia, it was, in Atlanta. Um, and I thought that I was going down there to learn how to maybe get some ideas to market my book better. Oh, okay. And I was told to become a life coach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was like, eh, you know. And, and it was funny because I actually was sort of like, just don't make me become a life coach. And so what did I do? I came back and went to life coach school. <laughs> and it was, you know, in a way, it's kind of, I think it was one of those balloon moments Right, okay, of me right. being the balloon and just saying, oh, okay, I guess that's what I should do. I'll drift with that way. I'll drift okay. that way. And, um, you know, I don't regret it at all. I mean, it's, it's probably been, you know, one of the top five things I've done in my life that I'm most proud of, um, going through that process and learning what I've learned and, you know, help. I joke sometimes that, you know, even if I never have a client again, you know, what I've learned and applied personally is worth it. So the life coaching, you learned, you applied it to your own life. Yes, yes. And I've, I've worked with clients too, but um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been one of the most freeing things I've ever done. Learned so much about myself, learned how to manage my mind. Um, you know, it's just been incredible. Well, it's, shouldn't a life coach first coach themselves in their absolutely. lives yes absolutely. and then they can coach others you have to kind of have your act together first well well not yes really no. act together but yeah I mean I'm all about taking imperfect action mm -hmm. you know if we wait until everything's perfect then it'll we'll, never it'll never happen yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so um but yeah I mean I I see it as a parallel right you know you do your work and you help others and that's what it's all about so what happened next? You, you, uh, you went to life coaching went, school yep. and you worked on yourself mm -hmm. and then you decided to work with others? Yep. I, um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, for a few years it was kind of, I was unclear. I mean, again, in life coaching um, circles and the you know, business circles that I've you know, learned from, it's all about the niche, right? What's your niche? Yes. And um, I, t it took me a while to discover my niche. I mean, now I know, you know, it is. It's women who struggle in their relationships with their moms who also feel that, you know, they don't have a voice or they don't, you know, that they have this something that they need to express in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, in a, uh, maybe it's art, maybe it's writing, maybe it's, you know, something else. But uh, creative women who are afraid and maybe who were told when they were little, you know, that's silly, <laughs> don't, you know, don't, don't focus on that. Um, but yeah, so I, I, my niche is, you know, again, it's the difficult mother-daughter relationship. Now you said um, all of us who have had a relationship problem with our mothers, <laughs> <me included. laughs> yes, and I've been writing about it a little bit, not too much. Um, 
Where does that all come from? What's the history of these, these, these mothers protecting and holding their daughters down? Why, why did they do that? And why did they still? Probably same reason, but. Yeah, there's, so there's a couple things. One, okay, so there's a concept, and I didn't make this up. Um, you can Google it and you'll see all kinds of things um, called the mother wound. And this is not about specific mothers, and it's not necessarily about specific wounds, but it's um, the concept is that women living in sort of a, you know, in the patriarchy, right, mm -hmm. um, male-dominated, um, were not allowed to express themselves the way they wanted to. They weren't allowed to do the things they wanted, you know, at one point we weren't allowed to vote. I mean, it's been a long you know, hard battle towards equality. Um, and I mean, sort of along with that too, you can even look at the, um, the balance of masculine and feminine energy, right? Which has nothing to necessarily to do with men and women because we have both, yes. right? But yeah. it's a, you know, a dominant uh, energy right now is, is the masculine and in some ways it's toxic, right? Because it's not in balance. And so women, right, are, you know, over the centuries, to survive in this, right, they hold themselves down, they don't shine, they don't express themselves, they don't, um, you know, everything is supposed to be proper, you know, whatever. I mean, and you can look at it in many different cultures, it shows up many different ways. And, you know, back in the day, women were literally burned at the stake. And in some countries, they're still stoned or burned or you know horrible things that happen right yes absolutely um, i mean in these days you know i mean there's i'm i'm really proud of some of our younger women who are shining the light on hey i can wear what i want you're not mm -hmm. supposed to rape me because i'm you know don't rape it's not about me wearing a short skirt right, right? it's about you keeping it in your pants yeah <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um you know and about consent right and our and our autonomy that we have so all of that right has built up over centuries right that that um you know they call the pain of being a woman right in this in this culture and so um what ends up happening is mothers want to protect their daughters right there's this fear and it's mm -hmm. unconscious pretty much that um, you know, if I let my if I let if my daughter is out there wearing a mini skirt, let's say, or um, you know, uh, doing something that maybe isn't considered appropriate, right? She's going to be burned at the stake. Now, okay, yeah, not yeah, really, not literally, no. But but, but mom know. will have her words said. Yes. Yeah, and so she's afraid, and so. Again, depending on the mother, depending on her own wounds that may have been not have been healed, right? Mm -hmm. She might not be aware of them. Um, you know, in some way, in some cases, a mother will act in a very toxic way to her daughter to protect her. Yes. You know, and so there's that fear on the one hand, and then what ends up happening sometimes is if a daughter dares to go and do her thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mom's jealous. And it's like, wait a minute, if I didn't get to do that, you can't either. And so that right there is sort of the broad, basic um, reason <laughs> why this happens. And I also think for, for some of us, depending on your generation, right? Back in the day, fear and shame were considered good parenting tools. Mm. Yes, right. Oh, and well, I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, they did what they thought was the right thing to do, and there were yeah. probably lots of, in their minds, good reasons to shame and fear, you know, create fear. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what they received. That's what they received. And, and their mothers were the same. It just kind of goes back and back and back. It's a pattern. It's a pattern. And it's to be repeated. And it's how we survived. Yes, yeah. So... So that is sort of the, <laughs> the big picture. And then, right, you can right. add in um, what happens when you're, a, when you're a woman and you're living in this kind of sort of unconscious pain, right? Addiction, mental mm -hmm. illness. So when you throw those things in and you have a mother who maybe is dealing with 
um, you know, as I said, addiction or a mental illness, or personality disorders, you know, mm -hmm. that complicates it. It does. Yeah, it does. Now, um, you said you had a, a difficult relationship with your mother. Was this kind of the pattern that was happening there too? Yes, yes. And um, some of the work that I have done over the past few years is to really um, take a look at my mom's life from a more uh, objective point of view. And in mm -hmm. fact, actually, this, was, this is fascinating. So my mother's mother, my grandmother, I became her legal guardian in 2011. And this was a woman who was very, very difficult. And I was afraid of her. But every, no one else was around. I was the most logical person to take over. And um, over the years, I got to know her in a way that I don't think anybody got to know. And I started to see wow, there's a lot of anxiety here, right? So when she would lash out and be mean and nasty, underneath that was just a, a tremendous amount of anxiety, mm. right? Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I think a very introverted woman who was expected to not be introverted, right? Like that wasn't valued to be alone. She just, she loved to be alone. Mm. And um, I, at one point, uh, you know, she was in a nursing home and I cleaned out her home and I found a treasure trove of letters that she and my mother wrote to each other when my mom went to college. She, my mom went to college for one year back in the late 50s. And um, these, what was amazing was that I had the letters that my mom wrote and the letters that my grandmother wrote back to her. They were both there. And I saw, so here's my mom at age 18 and telling her mother about falling in love for the first time. Wow. And, um, and, and my grandmother writing back and shaming her, right? Yeah. And um, then my mom flunked out her first year. She and her father would joke in the family. I had heard this joke for many years. Yeah, she majored in bridge and boys. And my mom was brilliant, right? She was a very, she is a brilliant woman, a very intelligent. And um, so she couldn't go back to school. The boy that she was in love with, that was over. And so at age 19, she goes to work and meets my dad and marries him. They weren't in love, right? They, you know, that was just, anyway, just being able to see all of that and, and to finally actually also see a picture of my mom and dad the day they got married, because they got divorced when I was three. Oh, wow. Right? So I had never seen a picture of my mom and dad together, ever. Oh. And there's the wedding picture, and there's my mom, right? This 19-year-old girl who, and you know, maybe I'm like creating something in my mind that's not in hers, but like... Mm -hmm. I just see this woman who probably wanted something very different than what she got. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's, you know, it's interesting, the, the cause and effect that happens in relationships, whether it's with your father, with your mother. And I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, I had a similar experience. Now, my grandmother was wonderful. She thought... I could do anything I want to. You want to do this? Do it. You know, she was very free-minded. And nobody listened to her. <laughs> except me. <laughs> but my mother was, you know, putting me in a box all the time. And uh, when she was paying attention to me, you know, which was on a rare occasion. Usually if I would do something bad to get her attention. Mm -hmm. Because I wouldn't have her attention otherwise. I was just kind of there. Um, and the, the, the wonderful thing that happened to me at the end of her life, her last five years, is she became very ill and I took care of her. And we hacked our way through all of these walls that we had built up between us. And I looked at her as a person, mm -hmm. not my mother, <laughs> a person. We talked about the things she used to do when she was a kid. We talked about um, 
when she fell in love with my father. Uh, we talked about um, a, a, everything. And I would ask her questions. And we figured out what our, um, what our negative problems were between us. And it wasn't me. <laughs> It wasn't me. Go figure. And all these, all those years, I thought it was me. You yeah. know that I was a bad kid, or I was just, you know. Well, that's. I, I mean, it's really common. Every child, I think, is like this. That, you know, um, they believe they are the center of the universe. Of course. And everything that's happening around them is happening because of them, and that's just yes. the way it is. And then, you know, our brains develop, and we. So what ends up happening, though, is some something, you know, insignificant might happen but your child brain makes it mean something. And sometimes they make it mean something bad about you. Yes. Right, which is not the truth, but that's what we do. Mm -hmm. The way we interpret things that happen. Yeah. yeah. Because the universe surrounds us and yep. we are the center of it all. <laughs> Aren't we still? <laughs> I have days when I think I'm still the center of the universe. <laughs> We're the center of our own universes. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> so here you are, okay, and you, um, you decided to write a book. Yes. And I, um, as I said, I was in the life coaching uh, mode at that point, the, the, the training, and I was actually doing a master certification. And in order to get that certification, I had to come up with a project. And the project that I chose was to create a six-week program for women who were interested in working on this issue. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of coincidentally, so I told you I was, the whole writing thing has always been very important to me. Yeah. Yeah. And when I started the life coaching thing, I kind of put the writing on the back burner. And, and I, 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 I struggled with my writing. I, I wanted to keep blogging, but I, something happened in my mind like, well, I, if I'm a life coach, then I can't blog the way I used to. I can't be that person that who was free and open and just saying whatever. Now I have to, you know, like as you said, Analyze. have it all together, right? <laughs> you know? And um, so I struggled with that. And um, so in 2000, 15, yes, it was in 2015, I was really making an effort to bring back writing and make them equal, right? Not like it's not, I don't have to do either or, right? I can do both and I can I still, so, yeah. I can still be myself, right? And um, so I took on, it, it sort of, it was like, a, okay, I'm going to bring this, these two things together again. And so what I did was I used the, um, that six month or that six week program that I created as sort of the bones of the book. Okay. And that's why I wrote the book because it was, as I said, what I had learned and applied in my own life was just so uh, transformative that I couldn't keep it to myself. And, um, and you know, I'm a writer, so. <laughs> and, and this is your niche. And it's okay. my niche, yeah. Because when you hear about daughters and mothers not getting along, guess what, it's pretty much everybody. <laughs> Well, can I brag? Yes, please brag. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> so the book came out in September of 2015, mm -hmm. and it is probably, I, it's, it was around 49,000, but like I'm guessing that by now it's probably about 50,000 downloads, uh, you know, sales of the book. Wow. So I have, I have a, you know, the Kindle version as well as a paperback. But didn't it also go up in the, in the charts at Amazon mm -hmm. quickly? Mm -hmm. Very quickly? Very quickly. <laughs> Tell us about that because I, I was pleased and amazed when I saw that. All right. So full transparency here, okay? Yes. Okay. So my publisher, what, what they do, and I think most publishers probably do this, mm -hmm. is they have a way of positioning it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. so that it, you know, will take off in its category. And, um, you know, and then also, and I know they, they've changed the rules on this, but, you know, you get your friends to write reviews. Of course. <laughs> of course. And, and, you know, so that's what happens. But I now have a lot more reviews from people I've never known. I don't know. So, you know, it's, it's obvious that it hit a chord <laughs> beyond my friends. Oh, it, it should hit a chord with everybody. I was one of those people that <laughs> read it and wrote a review. <laughs> 
at, in those early days. Yeah, yeah because yeah. it so touched me. <laughs> and it's different. I mean, uh, being an Amazon bestseller, like technically, I'm an international bestselling author on mm -hmm. Amazon, and that is very different than like being a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, well, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's it's a different entirely different category yeah. actually yeah but you never know right no I bet you the same people that would read your book if the New York Times uh, said this this is a great book they're still gonna read your book because of the subject matter they're yeah. gonna find it and read it and and you know the other thing too one of the reasons I wrote this book is because so as I mentioned, I'd done therapy and there are a number of other books out there about mother-daughter relationships that were very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And they, okay, so I'm not going to blame the books, but when I read those books, I felt stuck. A lot of them were books like, you know, Mothers Who Can't Love or Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers, you know, things like that. And they were all focused on the mother and what's wrong with the mother oh. and I remember being like well geez okay if, if the you know if my if my mother's got all these issues then I'm screwed <laughs> you know? like, well according I, to those books yeah <laughs> and I so I set out to write a book that's more about the daughter mm -hmm. right and what the daughter can do for herself in order to feel better and move on and go and do the things that you want to do. The things, I mean, I held myself back for so long because of what I believed about myself and what I believed, you know, that my mother had done to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's, that's uh, some, some of the, the comments that I get from people are along those lines that, you know, they really appreciate this book because it, it helps them take the steps that they want to take. And it's not for everybody, because there still are, and I used to be one of these people, women who want to hang on to their stories of their horrible mothers. Yes, of course <laughs> there are some of those, yes. They're, they're still tied by the strings, yes. so to speak. Yes. I was so, never one to let those strings get my way. <laughs> it was one of the rebellious ones. <laughs> well, I did. I mean, I, I, I had a story about my mom for so long, and um, it can be it can be identity rattling to let that stuff go, and, and so it's courageous work to do. Of course, it is. Yeah, it is. It's it's hard work, and you cry a lot. Okay, <laughs> I we I like to laugh, and I I try to make it fun. I do because yeah, yeah sometimes we cry, but well, yeah, of course sometimes we cry. But the the thing is, as you're um, working on the yourself using this book what you do is you stop and you start remembering it, it, it kind of brings back memories mm -hmm. and so you're kind of off in this 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 old story okay so you're yeah. reliving this old story and you're feeling the feelings that you felt mm -hmm. with this old story which, of course, you've got to live through and examine and figure out and say, okay, all right, but, you know, I survived that, and it wasn't me anyway. So then you can move on. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, um, it, it kind of drains you in some ways. But then the freedom that comes mm -hmm. and the opportunity to find out who you are and what you want to do, because guess what? I'm free. And I don't have to do the shoulda, woulda, couldas that my mom was saying. Yep. And I think, too, I mean, a lot of times we're unconscious to the stories. We're unconscious to the thoughts that we're thinking constantly that are running, you know, running the show, basically, and we're not aware of them. And some of the techniques and the tools that I outline are about bringing those to the surface. And... Um, helping you become curious and fascinated with yourself rather than beating yourself up like oh I'm because I spent a lot of years believing that I was pathetic and you know that there was something inherently wrong with me that I couldn't get over it or whatever um, and so it's about bringing those to the surface and then being curious and saying oh wow look at me thinking I'm pathetic isn't that interesting right rather than it being something that's like you know Mm -hmm. weighing me down. 
And it's, it's interesting too, probably, each one of us that reads the book and goes through, it's kind of like a workbook. Yeah. There's, yeah. And goes through the, the, the process. <clears throat> we all react differently, we all, but it, it, it has a good ending to it. It's a book with a really great ending to it because it, it does free you up and make you think about things in a different way than you thought about it before. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about that uh, when we come back. We're going to take a little break right now. And uh, we do have a lot more to talk about. Okay, so hang in there and we'll see, the, see you on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> you always made sure I brushed my teeth. You told me that smart was cool. You always told me to dream big. To all of those parents who took the time to make raising their children their most important job, we'd like to say... Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thanks, Mom and Dad. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. If you keep tanning, indoors or out, the effects of harmful rays will show up on your skin. Wrinkles, age spots, and an increased risk of melanoma, the second most common cancer in women 15 to 29. Stop tanning. Time may not be on your side. Learn how to protect your skin at spotskincancer.org. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. You'd do anything to take care of that spot on your lawn. So why not take care of that spot on your skin? If you're a man over 50, you're in the group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the cancer that kills one person every hour. Check your skin for suspicious or changing spots. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out what to look for. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Oh, hey, bud. We're, uh... Where are you headed? Uh, I'm just going to hang out. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. I've been meaning to ask you, is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. If any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. And we're back. Hi there. Um, we're here with From This Corner TV with Karen Anderson. And uh, we want to talk about the title of the book that's got that word separate in yes. it. Let's talk about that because it's not what you think it is. So, Karen, tell us what you mean by that. So, let me preface it by saying that in some cases, it's probably the absolute best thing to do to not see your mother. Or to not talk to her. If that's the choice that you feel is right for you, for whatever reason, I would never tell somebody, oh no, you're supposed to see her, or oh no, oh, no you're not supposed to, right? Okay, that's yeah. up to the individual, obviously. But the word separate in the title is about becoming emotionally separate. And what ends up happening with so many mothers and daughters, and this is a psychological term, and I am not a psychologist, but the term is called enmeshment. And what that means is that um, one person in the relationship believes that the other person is responsible for their emotions and vice versa. Oh. Right? So, um, and this starts young, right? You can, I remember one day seeing a woman in the grocery store lean down to her daughter and say, you make mommy so happy when you're good, mm -hmm. right? And so the little girl is like, oh, if, my, if, I'm my, mommy, if I want mommy to be happy, then I need to be good. I'm, I'm responsible for mommy's happiness. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and vice versa, like, you know, a teenage daughter, young 20-something daughter, mom, you piss me off right? Mm -hmm. Mom pisses me. Like, she believes that her mom is responsible for her anger. Okay. Right? And so, and, and then also we believe, so we believe that they're responsible for ours, and we believe that we're responsible for theirs. And they, you know, so that it's all this, it's like, that's why they call it enmeshment, right? Okay. Yeah. So, when I talk about separating, I'm talking about that emotional separation where, so obviously, I wrote this book for daughters. Mm -hmm. Mothers don't have to participate. 
so we're going to focus on the daughter, right? So the daughter decides to stop um, making her mother responsible for her emotions, and she starts to not make herself responsible for her mother's emotions. So she separates emotionally and starts to take responsibility for her internal emotional landscape, basically. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. And in order to do that, um, we, we have, that's where we're paying attention to what we believe and to those maybe unconscious thoughts that we think. Right? So I, for a long time, and I didn't realize this, but I was living with a story that my mother was out to get me. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? That's what I believed. And so I, so I, um, I felt defensive a lot of the time. And I believe, well, of course I've got to be defensive, right? So my emo emotionally, I believed that she was causing me to feel that way. But I was causing me to feel that way with the thoughts that I was thinking. So I was, when I started to take responsibility for that, and I was no longer, you know, making her responsible or blaming her for how I felt, that's, that was, there was a lot of freedom there. And, you know, we're, we're taught to take responsibility for our actions, right? That's what we're oh, taught. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we don't understand that we can't take responsibility for what we do unless we're taking responsibility for our emotions. Because, so here's, here's a tool from, directly from the book. Okay. Okay, this is sort of like self-coaching 101. And it's and, and I didn't make it up, but the, the woman who I've, is a mentor of mine who taught me a lot. Um, and there's, I think, probably many different versions of this. But there's the circumstances that are out in the world, right? The things that are happening, the other people, the weather, you know, all the things that are, we can't control. Right. And those things are factual, right? Those are things that can be proven in a court of law. Yes. There's no judgment. There's no opinion, right? They're yeah. just the facts. And then our thoughts and beliefs and opinions and judgments and all the things that are swirling around in our mind about the circumstances. Gotcha. Okay. Right? <laughs> yes. And all of that that's swirling around in our mind 24-7 all the time creates our emotions, right? That's, mm -hmm. those, that's, how we fe that's why we feel the way we feel. And the way we feel then drives our behavior. Okay. So when you can take a situation and break it down into those parts, you can see, okay, the circumstance is I have a mother. That's it, right? That's the only thing mm -hmm. that can be proven in a court of law. That's a fact. That's a fact, right? Like all the things that I'm thinking about her and maybe believe to be circumstances like, I mean, I hear a lot of women say, oh, my mom's stirring the pot, you know, or oh, yeah. she, you know, well, <laughs> no. She, the, the circumstance is that you have a mother who said something, right? <laughs> That's right. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And everything else is an opinion or a judgment. And when you, so then if you have an opinion that that's bad, and then you feel angry, and then you act a certain way because you're angry. Yes. And then you have results in your life. And so, like, you know, these are sort of like chronic thoughts and chronic emotions, right, that are constantly running the show. And the results that you have in your life basically prove the thoughts that you're thinking all the time. So interesting. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. So so that so separating. That's why it's about that separation. So you can get clear on what's going on in here that's causing your emotional uh, reactions or responses right. or whatever you want to call them. And the thing is, we're reacting to something we really don't understand anyway. <laughs> because your mother is saying something and doing something that she may not even understand why she's doing, but, but she's doing it. That's her emotion. That's yeah. her action. Yeah. And we're just witness, and it doesn't really mean that we have to get involved. Right. And what I used to do was I used to stop listening to her <laughs> just let her go on and on but, you know I mean that's a normal thing to do sometimes because I would just wait till she was done and then of course me being me I'd say are you done now <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and she'd get pissed at me. But you know, I mean, that's just kind of the way it was. But at the end, okay, at the end of her life, those five years that we worked on our relationship, we got to know each other as people, and I actually got to understand where she was coming from. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have anything to do with me. Had nothing to do with me. Yep. And uh, doing the, the workbook, you can go through a very similar uh, realization. Yeah. That's that, that separation. Her emotions and your emotions have nothing to do with each other sometimes. Right. And it's, it's really an interesting thing to th when you stop and think about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, something we haven't talked about, and, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book about boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, it's not so much what our mother said and did, although that's certainly important. It's what they modeled and what they believed about themselves. Mm -hmm that I think can have a greater impact. And boundaries are something that a lot of women weren't taught because it wasn't modeled. And so there's very loose boundaries. And when there's loose or no boundaries, there's a lot of anger and resentment. That's usually, they t that tends to go together. Now boundaries, um, we're not talking about uh, restrictions placed on you as a daughter, right? We're not talking about that kind of boundary. No. Boundaries, um, there's a, there's a lot, boundaries are interesting. I mean, and I think that they've, the concept of boundaries as a, you know, in, in therapy or whatever, um, in relationships has evolved. And, um, you know, a lot of women who I talk to are like, I need to have a boundary. And it's, it's usually from a mm, place, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm angry, right? And I need a boundary. Um, and I, you know, ultimately, boundaries, again, are about that um, understanding of your needs, wants, desires, knowing that this is okay and this is not okay, mm -hmm. right? Um, like, you know, we were talking earlier about moms who smoke. <laughs> yes, we were. <laughs> you know, and um, so, you know, a daughter who, who, the situation with me was my mom would get in the car with me in my car and start smoking. Mm -hmm. And I'd get all pissed, and I'd roll down the windows, and she'd roll them up, and I'd hump and, you know, can't you wait? And, and then one day I said, um, Mom, if you'd like to smoke, I will pull over, and you can get out and smoke. And she said, okay. <laughs> Without, so it was like all the drama was gone. But it was, it, I was clear. I was clear yeah. about my desires, and I wasn't, part of it for me too in the past was, believing that she shouldn't smoke and so yes. i was like trying to teach her a lesson and mm -hmm. you know i'm like if you want to smoke go go for it you know i'm not you know this isn't about trying to manipulate somebody else's behavior my mother and i went through the same thing similar thing except i was in her house visiting and she was a smoker and i have a tendency to get very asthmatic uh, mm -hmm. under certain conditions, one of them being around a lot of smoke. And my mother had a lot of smoke in that house. So mm -hmm. I, I, what I did was realizing that she was going to sit there and smoke in the house with me there and I wouldn't, either wouldn't survive or I would just have to get up and leave. So I said, we have some options here. Let's talk about the options that we have <laughs> so that um, I could go stay in a motel room nearby and then we could meet at a restaurant and visit and then you could come home and I could go back there be, uh, and um, that way I'd be able to continue breathing. <laughs> and you know, I'm, this is how I presented it. And you know, one of the other options was I said, and we could open all the windows, air out the house, and then when you would like to smoke, you could step outside and smoke outside. You, you have a, you know, a, a patio and everything, very nice one, you know. And um, so we just went through the options and she chose to air out the house and smoke outside while I was there so that I could continue to breathe and <laughs> stay there and visit. <laughs> Yeah, but there, you know, again, there's um, lots of patterns that have been set, and you know, <laughs> buttons that get pushed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a chapter in the book called "Buttons and Thorns and Triggers" or something like that. Uh, oh my, right? Because we believe, you know, we're triggered and we have our buttons, and like, what if? 
I like to say, what if we don't actually have a button? <laughs> <laughs> what if it's just our thoughts, you know? But, um, yeah, so boundaries can be a way to actually bring some intimacy. It sounds kind of like with your mom, that it, it became almost humorous. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it allowed some intimacy in. It did. Rather than, you know... Because we sat there and we were looking at each other and smiling and yeah. going, okay, now, uh, it's, yeah, so yeah. we've got options, yeah. okay. <laughs> and it's funny because I realized that I didn't have boundaries for so long, and when I started to actually have boundaries, she didn't like it. She, you know, she was used to me being sort of this compliant, you know, roll over and <laughs> do whatever she wanted, you know, and um, yeah, it was a little rocky. Well, you said that when she found out you were writing a book, she didn't like it. Well, that was my first book. Oh, that was the first book. Oh, okay. And that actually, that was actually kind of um, intense. Um, she didn't, she didn't like that I was blogging, and she didn't like the fact that I was writing a book. It's, it's funny because I had told her several times that I was writing a book, the first one, and she, <laughs> she would forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I would be offended that she didn't seem interested. But um, at the end of 2010, we had a huge falling out. And she had sent me an email that um, I judged as being very hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I cut it off with her at that point. Because, and this was before I understood what I know now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the idea of separating, let me just say this too. Sometimes I think a daughter needs some time without that influence to sort of say, what, wait a minute, who am I, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Without, you know, mom's constant whatever. <laughs> That's why so many of these young girls want to go away to school. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we, we actually ha um, did not speak for m several years. And... Um, there have, you know, there were, she sort of reached out to me at one point and asked me what I was going to do to fix it. And we kind of went back and forth via email for a little while. And it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't easy. <laughs> I was a new life coach by that time. And I was using all <laughs> these tools. And I think it kind of annoyed her. But um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, we... Um, what we're, about now? Well, I hadn't heard from her in about a year. Um, again, she and her mother were not close, and, and she had, you know, tremendous issues with her mother. And, yeah. um, and because I was her mother's legal guardian, I was, re I was required by law to communicate with my grandmother's children, so my mom and my, mo my aunt and my uncle. Um, you know, I had to keep them up to date, and I was her, mm -hmm. I was her trustee. She had a lot of money, um, <laughs> so I had to like do these reports, and but it, that's all it was. You know, it was that kind of contact. Mm -hmm. And um, when my, when she died, she my grandmother died uh, a year ago. She was ninety eight. That's amazing. I know. Um, so you know, I called my mom, and I wasn't going to email her and say, "Well, she's dead," you know. But yeah. um, and. And I did, I have, I've seen my mother once. I saw her in 2014. And it was funny because that, that was when I told her. I, I said, you know what, Mom, I'm letting you off the hook. I, you, you no longer have to approve of everything I do. Because <laughs> I constantly sought out her, her approval and her That's validation. That's natural yeah. for your child to want it. Yeah, yeah. But I told her I was letting her off the hook and that I, you know, um, you know, I'm in charge of my own feelings now, and that, you know, I, I also, because she, she tends, tended to say things like she was ashamed of me, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, if you want to feel shame, that's fine, but I, I'm choosing not that. I don't want to feel that, and I think it kind of confused her, and, I, you know, in a way, I don't, I don't blame her, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, for 50 years I was <laughs> one way, and now all of a sudden, boom, I'm this other way. It must be confusing. But um, so I hadn't heard from her in about a year, and she called me on my birthday, um, November 10th this year. And um, 
it was an interesting conversation. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the door is always open. We'll see. So you say it was an interesting conversation because... Well, she called to wish me a happy birthday, which sometimes she acknowledges my birthday and sometimes she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't take it personally. I used to. I don't anymore. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, we, we chatted. It was a nice conversation. And, and, uh, and then a, a, a subject came up that was... Uh, difficult <laughs> and I veered out of peaceful daughter territory for a second <laughs> but I caught myself I'm proud of myself oh, that's good. you know I think the thing that I am most proud of is that I like and respect myself mm -hmm. when I interact with her and in the past uh, you know if I'm honest I, I you know I didn't I don't really like and respect the way I used to act then yeah I'm the same way I yeah <laughs> we don't need to go there but this the interesting thing about this is it could be uh anyone mm -hmm. Th this this book could say something else uh the peaceful uh person's guide right right uh, again it's about creating peace inside understanding that our peace that we want to feel depends on us Right, mm -hmm. and other people can do whatever they want, and it doesn't have to affect our peace. And so, yeah, it could be the peaceful son's guide to separating from a difficult father, or, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be the peaceful mother's guide to separating from a difficult daughter. <laughs> or even uh, the peaceful wife separating from a difficult husband. Right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Or I could have used that book three times. Okay. But <laughs> or even in the workplace, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, with difficult bosses or you know, co-workers. Well, hold the book up for a second so they can see what it looks like. That's where it's like. Yes, there you <laughs> go. There you go. It's kind of hard to see because it's white, but yeah. it's called The Peaceful Daughter's go. Guide to Separating from a Difficult Mother. And it could be, as we said, it could be anyone in any kind of a relationship. Oh, even with yourself. Even with your relationship. Most even especially with yourself. With yes, yourself. <laughs> absolutely. So what's next for you? Well, I am, I've created um, some live workshops and mm -hmm. a retreat that I'm doing with a partner um, at the end of April. The live workshops I am doing at um, the Guest House uh, Retreat and Conference Center in Chester, Connecticut. Um, and I'm, I'm, my goal is to do six of them next year. Um, I also do monthly calls, mm -hmm. very inexpensive, you know, group calls. Um, and on the writing front, I am working on my third book, mm -hmm. which is, I'm writing it as, um, it, this is going to be very much a memoir. So the second book here, The Peaceful Daughters book, um, is sort of, I mean, there's part personal stuff in there, but it's more of a self-help. Yeah. And this third book is going to be a memoir, and I'm writing it as a letter to the daughter that I chose not to have, because I I never wanted to have kids, and mm -hmm. I I think when I was younger I assumed that I would have them someday, but I never desired them. And um, at one point in my young life, I um, I became pregnant, and terminated that pregnancy it, it's funny I, <laughs> all right it's TMI I won't go there but anyway suffice it to say I knew almost immediately that I was pregnant and mm -hmm. I knew almost immediately that this was not right for me and um, so I, I've, I feel very much uh, desire to share with that wisp of energy <laughs> that would have been my daughter, sort of the why, why. And um, as, I, as I said, as I got to know my grandmother mm -hmm. and understand more about her life and, and the ways that she was probably, you know, disappointed and, you know, her mother wound and yeah. my mom and her mother wound and, you know, saying, you know what, I, I didn't want to pass that on. I didn't want to pass it on. So I'm writing this as a memoir. Um, 
you know, looking at certain uh, key points in my life, key, key decisions, um, to s sort of let her know Interesting. what it was about. Writing can be very th therapeutic. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is a huge component of um, the work I do with, with my clients. It's, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how you can write a letter to someone who has um, been a problem in your life or who has mm -hmm. influenced you um, in a way that you want to let them know, thank you for teaching me a lesson, but I really didn't like it. I didn't enjoy <laughs> it and all that kind of stuff. You know, just writing a letter to someone, whether they're alive or not, mm -hmm. um, is th very therapeutic. You get it out. You know, yeah. to hold things like that in is not a good thing. And then it's, it's like getting rid of the old story, you exactly. know? And then leave, clearing that room uh, for a new story to develop, a better story. Well, you know, in the beginning when you introduced me and you talked about how the concept that I love, which is that the truth never creates suffering. Mm -hmm. So the stories that we tell ourselves that make us suffer are not the truth. Right? So, yeah. like the stories that I used to tell about my mom or about myself, um, you know, and yeah, maybe, you know, somebody might say, oh, you're not being realistic, right? Or your rose colored glasses or something like that. But um, I really do believe that, you know, we can retell a story. The facts might still be the same, right? But you interpret it differently. Yes. So that you're not creating suffering anymore for yourself. Exactly. That's something to keep in mind um, every day of your life. <laughs> <laughs> this has been wonderful. It's this awesome. has been wonderful. Is it over already? I'm, I'm, I'm like... sorry that it's ending already. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I uh, look forward to this, this new book. I really, really do. Thank you. And it, it sounds like your uh, life coaching with what you know, what you've experienced, what you've put together is going to help a lot of people. Thank you. And, I hope uh, so. I okay. think that's a wonderful thing. You can contact her. Um, um, we showed her her website, uh, KarenCLAnderson.com, KCLAnderson.com. And um, thank you again. Oh, thank we, you. We, we're trying to figure out. Um, I also want to thank our, our sponsors. Uh, but we were trying to figure out. I always leave, leave the show with a quote. And I had come up with a couple and we said, yeah, 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 yeah. So, this is from Karen to you, okay? Healthy boundaries are your values in action. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> and if you have ideas for, uh, for a show that you think uh, people would enjoy, send me an email. Let me know, okay? And thank you so much for joining us again on From This Corner TV. And we'll see you the next time.